Welcome to this presentation. Uh, we're looking at the analysis of 1D problems. Uh, we talked about 1D elements uh, in the previous uh, presentation. So here we're going to look at using those to analyze some different problems. And specifically, we're going to look at a heat transfer problem as well as a fluid problem. And more universally, how you can apply it to other problems, but focusing on these two for now. Uh, we'll also have an ANSYS example uh, in the middle of this. All right, so you can go to the lecture materials. The link, again, is down below in the notes. Uh, for folders um, and the notes, you can go to, again, the link. Um, and we're looking for the analysis of 1D problems. All right, so where are we heading in this presentation? We're going to analyze the one-dimensional problems, as I mentioned, the heat transfer as well as fluid mechanics. And we're going to do some ANSYS work as well. And that will be specifically with a heat transfer problem. All right, so uh, heat transfer with one-dimensional linear elements. Um, so we've looked at a fin uh, briefly before. We're going to look at it more in depth here. Um, but we uh, have a heat source at the base over here. And uh, modes of heat transfer, we have conduction in the x direction. So conduction along the fin this way, uh, moving from hot to cold. And we have convection to the surrounding fluid to the fin surfaces. So we've got convection that's going across the surface here as well as on the back side there. So the governing differential equation that we have for this is, is this. So we got um, conduction that's happening here, and we have the overall conduction that's happening between the temperature on our, um, on our fin and the temperature of the fluid that surrounds it. So K is our thermal conductivity. A is a cross-sectional area in the direction of conduction. All right, so it's going down the cross-sectional area as you move down the fin. H is the convective heat transfer coefficient, and P is the thin perimeter. So that, that accounts for the uh, heat loss from the surfaces of the fin. And Tf is the temperature of the surrounding fluid. And Tb is the temperature of the base, uh, which is the source. Not shown in this equation, but will come up as we go through this. All right, so we're using linear elements. So we need two boundary conditions. Uh, one boundary condition is pretty obvious at the base, at x equals zero is the temperature at the base. But the second boundary condition, uh, we could have one of the following. So one, we could just say, hey, we know the temperature of the fluid at the tip of the fin, and that's going to be constant. It's going to be constant at the fluid uh, temperature. So it's so long that there's not going to be any additional temperature increase at the, at the tip of the fin. We could also have no heat loss at the tip. So you can see the conduction, uh, basically the, the, the temperature gradient, dt over dx, is equal to zero, because k is not going to be zero, and area is not, not going to be equal to zero. So the temperature gradient at the end of the fin is not going to exist. There's not going to be a gradient, so basically be insulation at the tip. Third option is we can have heat convection to the fluid uh, at the tip. So here we have our conduction equation. So we got conduction to that last element, and then we have convection from that element to the fluid that surrounds it. So we'll look at these here as we move through. The governing differential equation represents an energy balance of the fin. All right, so we will approximate the solution with linear elements uh, of the form uh, using our linear shape functions. So the shape function node i and shape function node j multiplied by the temperatures at those corresponding nodes. So there are shape functions in uh, global coordinates, as well as in matrix form there. All right, so hopefully you have that. Again, if you need to, go back and check out the first the, uh, the 1D uh, elements presentation. All right, so the general form of our differential equation, as we mentioned before, is this. Uh, we can also represent it as this. So if we take our K and our A, and we generalize to just saying, hey, there's a constant there, a coefficient, as well as with HP, we have a coefficient, so the negative sign would be wrapped up in the coefficient here as well. And then we have just a constant there, uh, coefficient 3. So there's our A minus HP, and uh, convection coefficient times the perimeter times the uh, temperature of the fluid. All right, so let's go one step further. Let's go even further, and let's make our differential equation very general and applicable to other problems. So we're going to set uh, the temperature equal to, to psi, all right? And we need to solve this thing using, all right, drum roll please, we've got a Glurkin formulation. All right, so one of these weighted residual methods 
that we learned earlier, so you can go back and check that out. It's the weighted residual presentation where we talked about the Glurkin formulation. So we're going to use that now as we go through this. All right. So remember, the basic idea of what we're doing is we want to assume an approximate solution first. So what's the what do we think the solution is going to look like? And we're going to substitute that in to the governing differential equation. All right, and then solve it. So the result has some residual error, then we work to, to put that to zero. Right? So the Glickin formulation, we're going to multiply the, the residual by a weighting function, average it, and set it equal to zero. Right? So here's the governing differential equation that we're going to have, that we do already have, actually. Uh, here's the weighted residual function. It's going to have the form of the, of the assumed solution, and then we're going to integrate uh, across the domain, across our dx, and that's going to be our residual, and we're going to set that equal to, to zero. So the weighting function must be the same form as the approximate solution. So again, we're going to use the linear shape function as our uh, to plug in there. So we're going to got three nodes in a row with elements in between. So nodes i, j, and k, we have element e and element e plus one. So the residual equation for node j, right, for node j here becomes uh, the residual of node j uh, from um, from element E and uh, plus the residual that we get from element E plus one. So they both contribute to what we see there at, uh, at letter J. All right, so combining those, here is our shape function at node J, all right, uh, for uh, the element E. And here's the shape function for node J at element E plus one. Here's our governing differential equation, all right? And so we're going to go from i to j and uh, integrate from, uh, dx from i to, I to j and then dx from j to k. All right, and we get those two forms of our equations there. All right, we will have a residual equation for each node in the finite element model. For example, here if we have uh, five nodes and four elements, we'll have a residual for each node uh, where r2 is the um, the residual for node 2 from element 1, and we have to get the residual for node 2 from element 2. So there's residual, residuals for a node from the element on either side of that node. That's what we have to combine here to make sure we have uh, the, the full accounting of the residual at a particular node. All right, so let's examine the nodal residual equations for nodes 1, 2, 3, and 4 here, specific to this problem. So. Again, we look at the residual for node 1. We have the shape function uh, at node 1 for element 1, uh, governing differential equation. And we're going to integrate that over uh, uh, from nodes 1 to node 2, set that equal to 0. All right, so that's all for element 1. So for, L, uh, for the residual at node 2, we have to get the residual uh, of node 2 from element 1. And we need to get the residual for node 2 at element 2. So now we're going to have more here, right? Because element 1 only had one element next to it. There was only element 1. There wasn't element uh, on the other side of it. So here we got uh, what's happening at element um, in element 1. So the state function for node 2 in element 1 in the governing differential equation. And we have the shape function for node 2 in element 2. Um, and the shape function or the governing differential equation there. All right, so as the arrows point out here, element one's contribution over here and element two's contribution over here. All right, we do the same thing for uh, node three. So we got element two's contribution here on the left and we have element three's contribution here on the right. Set that all equal to zero. And for the residual, residual at node four, again, the contribution here for, from uh, element three and the contribution here for element from element four. All right, and you continue that on and on and on the rest of the way. So in general, for element E with nodes I and J, the residual at node I for a given element is the shape function of that node in that element times the governing differential equation. All right, and the residual for node J in that element is the shape function of node J and that element times the governing differential equation integrated over the distance from j to k. Right? So that's our 
two different residual equations. So now let's manipulate the second order uh, term from the governing equation into a first order term. Just have a correction I want to make here. Uh, realized that, that uh, again, this is all for element E, and element E consists of node I and node J. So that should be just like it is up here, um, the location of node I uh, integrated to the location of node J. This should be I, that's a strange looking I, I to J. So just heads up with that. I think I had J and K there, I got mixed up there. So this is I and J. All right, so again, let's go back. We're going to try to get this second order term into a first order term, and we'll see why here in a bit. All right, so keep your finger here or in the notes, or just come back to this, uh, note the time, uh, and because we'll come back to 